tall uh, men on horseback. And they had long trumpets. Strange, I remember these things from my young childhood, and I can't, I can't tell you where I put my glasses. In. <laughs> well, at any rate, the uh, First World War, war almost started then, but the Kaiser backed down. In Munich, I saw the first dirigible. As you probably know, a dirigible is a balloon with a structure a cigar-shaped structure so that it keeps its shape. An ordinary balloon is sort of like an umbrella and they build a fire under it. And if they want to come down, they open a vent at the top and that lets some of the hot air escape and it drops. Well, I saw my first dirigible there. And then after, well, I visited my mother for just a few hours at Davos, Switzerland, which is a big res is a resort city and above that is shots on the mountain side is shots out shots out s c h a t z a l p alp is alpine and there they had these people laying in the sun on uh, lounges and uh, I don't know what was wrong with the American mountains. Goodness knows we got, we've got mountains that'll match them any place. But you had to go to Switzerland <laughs> in order to get cured. And let's put it this way, she lived a good many years afterwards. Let me interrupt you here just a minute so I can put some introduction on that tape so we know what the person who's recording it knows what they're doing. Uh, this is January the 28th, I believe, and, I think it is. and I'm, my name is Mike Carney, and I have the honor of interviewing Mr. Leon Bueller, B-U-E-H-L-E-R. By the way, what are you with Ashford? I'm simply on the Historians Committee, and I'm a member down in the St. Louis chapter now, and I had been a member in the Nashville chapter. You're what, a consultant? No, sir. Just a just a member. I oh, as a as an engineer, yeah. I work for a company called Computer Environments, oh. and we design and build computer rooms. Oh. We got something in common. I'll tell you about that later. Okay, uh, Mr. Bueller was past president of Ashray during the years of. I don't know when you were president, sir. Hmm. I have it someplace, but. 
Okay. I don't know. We're going to look that up. But anyway, we're 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 here in Chicago, Illinois, and uh, it's my pleasure to interview Mr. Bueller tonight. We're going to let him talk, and we're going to try to get into some of the things he remembers about his role in ASHRAE and the refrigeration arts as he saw it practiced. I uh, came at a time when Ashray was simply a refrigeration society, refrigeration engineer society, and on uh, mostly the application was comfort cooling. Cooling as opposed to ice making and... Well, they had ice making too. They never had gone into superconductivity. Matter of fact, at that time it wasn't known. No atom smashers. <coughs> no anything of that sort. Uh, when it came to air conditioning, the only uh, uh, normal air conditioning that you'd think of I installed it in my own home. At the same time, curing a flooding situation we had in our basement, I put in a sump tank and a pump, raised the uh, uh, drain pipes up above the pump and uh, then the pump would get rid of the uh, yes go ahead The uh, <laughs> pump then pumped that over into the sewer, and the village of Skokie had the sewers rusted up, and that didn't cure it. About that time, my wife was in the hospital with a broken, either a broken hip or a spinal fusion. She's had broken bone trouble all her life, or a good part of her life. Uh, I got that pretty well fixed up at our home. And when uh, we decided to move out here because of the fact that they did have a health care center and independent living facilities and so forth, and uh, 
My wife is still living in a, in, in a big apartment here at Independent Living, and she doesn't belong here. She isn't as well as I am. But that shouldn't come too much of a surprise. That, at any rate, Tell me what you did. You put you pump water out of a sump and then just ran it through a cooling coil, just directly, and then into the sewer. Yeah, and the sewer wouldn't handle it because of too much water. Yeah, and the uh, that was the fall of the village, but it was a, a long time before they ever got that corrected. Um, about that time, my wife was having all sorts of back trouble and so forth, and my daughter saw an ad of this place. It sounded good to her, and I came out with it, and I think we paid eighty or ninety thousand dollars for an apartment here. Uh -huh. Now that's on the independent living side. And after one of us, several of her spells, my wife landed down in this section. She finally left there came up to the apartment and she got into the tub. She couldn't get out and goodness knows if I'd have tried to, if I'd have leaned over, I'd have just tumbled in on top of her. But there was a and that's one of the things that brought me out here. This is one of the cords. There's a cord in there on the right-hand side. If I should get trouble in that bathroom, I pull that cord and at least theoretically, they're supposed to come running. It's a, uh, it's an alarm, sure. and that is one of the things that attracted me out here. I figured that was very smart. Well, yeah. Now I'm almost 90 years old, and I have pulled that cord a number of times, and they've been prompt in running. This this place, is not a poor house. It's expensive, but most of the uh, health care places have gone broke, went belly up, and this place suddenly was really jammed full of people. Uh, uh, lots of the, they still have about a hundred percent reserve, Sign which they have used for 
some improvements, but what a lot of the people that don't know where their next penny is coming from want it to be used in reducing rents. And the management here wouldn't listen to it. And I went into the place that the head man offers here and I told him, don't be an ass and split up that surplus you've got. You'll end like all the others. He says, uh, well, I'm glad you feel that way. That's exactly what I'm doing. So, uh, I'm glad you're in this place. It, it sounds like a good one. Um, it's the best in the Chicago area, I can tell you that. My, before I got it, it took it all, went into it, my daughter saw an ad about it, and we went and looked at it. And then I asked our doctor from Skokie, our family physician, and he uh, his first reaction was. You know, I've gone to any number of these nursing homes, and you can, most of them, almost every one of them, you could smell two blocks away. I said, well, that's a good beginning. Now stay there and stick your nose deeper in. Uh, Go down to the health care center. How clean is it? How did it how does it smell? Uh, and he finally came back that he had never, never looked into a nursing home that looked like this. And then I sent our CPA over because I'm no longer mentally able to uh, uh, make out a uh, an income tax return and payments. Uh, I don't have the least idea, but I do know that our state is <coughs> is pretty comfortably over two million dollars, and uh, with the diversification and everything, and lawyers' fees and so forth to try to keep things straight. The whole business got too much for me. And I had everything put for our daughter and our husband to manage along with our legal help, the people that we'd been dealing with, and the bank, the First National Trust, the uh, First National Bank of Chicago. Uh, as it is now, by gosh, I don't have a nickel in my pocket. <laughs> You're like President 
But most anything I want, charge it to my account at Friendship Village. And they pass it on to my daughter in Wilmette. And I let it be known I didn't want to see another bill. I wasn't going to spend a nickel. Uh, and right now, I wish I had a few extra pennies that I could treat you. <laughs> you don't need to treat me. I'm having fun at this. I enjoy this. Sort of thing. But uh, I tell you, it's work. Just close it all together. Sounds like you've gotten yourself into a pretty good situation here, and your daughter's not all that far away. No. And I talked to your granddaughter also. Before I Which came. one? Oh, now. Uh, Sherry, is that her name? Yes. Sherry? Ch uh, yeah, well, she uh, she's the oldest. And she has a daughter, by the way, who's quite an athlete. Sure and a shining star in school. And she has another daughter. They've had trouble with her since she was born. And they found out it was something to do with her hearing. And the village of Skokie sent her to the best doctors. And they put a tube down her ear. And she's doing very well now. And that didn't cost her a nickel. Skokie is quite a, is quite a progressive city. Uh, village. Mm -hmm. But one of the things I did when I was a little tot, an uncle of mine gave me an antique key wound watch. Uh, a week later or so, I was on a transatlantic liner home, and the first thing I took care of, I dropped that watch overboard. Oh, my goodness. I bet you've been sick about that ever since. Yeah, yeah that's right. That thing would be worth a fortune today. But one of the things when I, uh, the last trip back, I think must have been about 1908. There weren't any transatlantic planes. I had seen a dirigible in Munich. That was, I think, the, undoubtedly the first one in existence. And, you know, when we got to New York, I saw the Statue of Liberty, and it just had been rejuvenated. Of course, I'd seen... I knew the Statue of Liberty. And at the same time, here came a, an airplane across. 
that was the maiden flight of the Wright brothers from their island in the Carolinas, I forget the name of the place. Kitty Hawk? Kitty Hawk. It was the first flight from Kitty Hawk to New York. What year was this now you're talking about? What? What year? Are you in 1908 that, or something like that? That thing must have been around 08, mm -hmm. something like that. So you were coming into the United States from Switzerland or Germany? From Germany. From Germany. Well, yeah, let's see. Yeah, I think we got on the ship in Bremen, but I couldn't, uh, I couldn't uh, swear to that. This was yourself and your dad? or No, my mother and I. And, you know, on that last trip, I think it was the last trip, Of course, they were, especially in the steerage, that's the lower decks, uh, they had a, a lot of, of immigrants that had never seen the U.S. before, and they had to go to Ellis Island. And I wasn't so damn dumb at the time, because I spoke up. I said, I'm a native-born American citizen, born in the Bronx, and there's no reason why I'd have to go to Ellis Island. It can take us to customs. And it did. Uh, on that second trip back, No. Quite a few years later, when we first moved out here, it was the last census taken. We had a big table set up with the uh, examining board or whatever, census takers. And I thought I'd have some fun with them. And I walked up and I, I talked an ear off of them in German. Not a one could understand me. It's a wonder because around Schaumburg there's an awful lot of people. Are you true? Uh, yes. Yes, you can have this. Done? Get involved in a certain thing. Ashray certainly wasn't the place for engineers practicing what I practiced. Were you a consulting engineer? I don't know your background. That's well, I had all sorts of jobs. I was with the Frick Company in Waynesboro, and that was my wife's, that's Pennsylvania, and that was my wife's hometown. Okay. And during the, uh, Depression, of 21, I almost left there, but a great aunt a great aunt of my wife's left her the most comfortable house I ever lived in. It was a log 
cabin. That house was built with, as I recall it, 14 by 14 cross-section logs. You could see the ads marks in them. The reason I found out, I wanted an extra window someplace. Well, my wife and I did. And I had that cut through. And you could see the ads, ads marks. That's how they squared it up. Uh, but, my gosh, you know, it took practically all night for the evening temperature to get through. You never did get the extremes. Uh -huh. And uh, that was just wonderful. Was that in Waynesboro? That was in Waynesboro. Okay. I've been uh, to the Frick plant there. In that I understand that burnt down the other day. The Frick plant did, sure enough. Well, that's what I got uh, through. <laughs> uh, my daughter got the news. Uh, Who are some of the people there that you remember at the Frick place? Benedict was Benedict. one. And, of course, a number of others. I, I got onto that when I finished my course at Cornell, and they were people in interviewing prospects. I hadn't made up my mind what I was going to do. I had, I went through Cornell, I had four different scholarships. Uh, and then I uh, got myself a job at the gymnasium. I had belonged to the Turnverein, that was a a gymnastic society uh, in my hometown of Mount Vernon, New York, just a suburb of New York. Yeah, it's, near the, it's near the Finger Lakes, isn't it? No, no, suburb of New York City. Oh, okay. And... Do you need to go in here? Do you need to go No, here? no. I'm going to sort of stretch out a little bit. At any rate, uh, they had a very, very competent instructor. He was a, a very good on the apparatus work. He was a fairly old man, but he was good enough that uh, We performed on the stage of the New York Hippodrome. We performed on the stage of the New York Hippodrome. Oh, gee, that's. And uh, that was something. Uh -huh. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> Now you can see my memory stretches way back. <laughs> and I know things pretty well from then. Those, those kinds of athletic clubs, I was in one such club in St. Louis where they had, it was, a, it was like a clubhouse. Yeah. And they evidently had instructors in gymnastics. Uh, that's and there was competition in this. Yeah, well, that's right. And this one... 
uh, of course they had they had a bar yeah. and uh, it was <laughs> unquestionably the uh, foremost club in the town uh, During the primaries and so forth, gosh, the uh, uh, candidates just flocked in there. Uh, they had they had a bar. They had the best of beers and wines. They had good food. <laughs> the gymnasium could be easily you could easily get a band in there and have a bazaar or have a dance and so forth uh, that was when you were in Mount Vernon now you, you were telling me about the Frick Company what did you do with the Frick Company? Was this a, a, a beginning level engineering that you were doing, or and what kind of projects were you working? On? Yes, uh, I'm just a little bit confused now. At any rate, I didn't sign up when they were uh, picking up. I, I hadn't made up my mind. I had just finished a semester of public speaking and the uh, professor there wanted me to, to uh, uh, take an extra term with him. I'll really make a, an orator out. And, but, no, I wanted to go see what the real world was like. I had no intention of becoming a professor myself. And uh, I just struck out and uh, the Frick Company Somehow or other, I got into Waynesboro. I don't remember how, but I, I got a, uh, uh, some assignments from them to to uh, look after trouble jobs that their own trouble shooters couldn't find. Uh, it's, it's a strange thing. Uh, I never got my hands dirty. I, uh, well, I can think of one case. Here was a good size ice tank I, ice makers in those days they had these these tall ice cans, cans. and they had bought the materials from the Frick company and they put the whole thing together. And one day I was on a job down in Virginia someplace and I got on the phone and called them. I said, that, uh, that's fixed now, what do you want me to do? He said, well, will you, on the way back, Stop in at this place. Now, don't do anything yourself. They just bought so much material from us and built it themselves. 
So I went there and uh, somehow or other I had developed before that uh, that I had a, a, a peculiar knack of taking one look at something and generally come with, with what was wrong. So, they told, they had called them and said that, that I, they were sending me and uh, when I got there, I was welcomed with open arms. They took me into the uh, into a, a private office, and after a while, the uh, general manager of the plant showed up. And he said, I'll, I'll show you around. So he headed for the ice tank. But that was where the trouble was. I said, I'm not interested in that. He said, well, that's where the trouble is. OK, if you know, if you know better, go and fix it. So they took me to the uh, engine room and they had a steam driven engine there a vertical machine that didn't have a crankcase it was like you had a, an automobile engine with no crankcase and you had to have someone there squirting oil on the uh, stuffing boxes and so forth. Uh, and when I walked into the uh, uh, engine room, I knew damn well what was wrong. Here was about as this three-story monstrosity of a compressor, engine driven, and I saw some fluid running, trickling down the connecting rod. And yet you smelled nothing. Have you ever smelled, a, 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 seen ammonia running down a connecting rod and not, not smell it? So I walked over. I put my finger on the rod. I tasted it. It was salty. I said, you might as well, you might as well shut that down. You might as well throw all of your brine away and all of your ammonia. Brine and ammonia had mixed. And when the brine was all out of the uh, tank, here was a header with a lot of coils connected to it. Everything looked normal enough. And I said, go down there and, uh, and examine. I'm, I'm not getting my good clothes dirty. Get down there and take a look. Are all of your tongue and groove flanges entered? That was it. Here was one 
that hadn't gotten into the joint. And it was a wide, it was a wide open hole. And uh, I told him, just throw it all away. That must have been a pretty impressive call when you walked in and found the problem. Yeah, I, I don't think I, I don't think I spent more than an hour there. Gee. Uh, then I, I had already gotten into uh, dairy stuff, and I remembered my mother being so upset when she got a bottle of milk. She always used to take the cream off and sour the skim and then put it in a cheesecloth and I think it was the whey that would drip and the uh, curd stay in the bag. Not with that milk. It just so happened she was having trouble with her milk. It wouldn't sour. Why wouldn't it sour? It was pasteurized. Petrified cream would go to the creamery, and they talk turn it into into ordinary grade butter. But uh, years later, after they rebuilt built the Lincoln Highway, got good roads, built. Uh, roads into the farmer's barnyard. Uh, so that he could get his stuff in and out. And I developed a sanitary milk house for the farmer. Concrete floor, uh, and all the works a stainless steel milk cooling tank. The milk, could, his milk could be put, picked up about maybe twice a week. That's when you began seeing these stainless steel. Uh, trucks on the road. And by the way, those trucks are not refrigerated because they get to the, can get, ordinarily can get to the dairy in time. And, and then we had to, we, uh, uh, Are they insulated, man? Uh, no. It's just straight, the skin of the milk is on the, on the skin of the, of the that's right. Hmm. And the uh, quality of milk really went up to that. Mm -hmm. And let me, let me interrupt you here just a moment. Uh, 
you, we've been chatting for about an hour and a half. For heaven's sakes. And uh, that's me. <laughs> you 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 learned, you learned how to do it from your your Cornell professor. Uh, I don't think we should do much more of this. I sense you're getting a little tired and fatigued. Uh -huh. and I think you are. Um, would you just briefly or think of the people that you remember well or the events of refrigeration that you remember well? What would you pass on to people about refrigeration in your time? Well, you know, it wasn't far from this time when I got spread out into other fields that weren't related, related at all. I got in this, into atom smashers. These tunnels where you have two loops and then bring them together to get them to uh, uh, collide and break up the atoms into smaller particles. Now, when those are big magnets, aren't they, in those tunnels? Do they have to be cooled? Yes. Yes. Definitely. Uh, for them to be uh, practical, you have to get into ultra-conductivity. Super cool. Uh, and at that time, that was practically down to a couple of degrees of absolute zero. Okay. And <laughs> then we found ways to bring that point up to higher temperatures. Uh, in the process, we got carbon dioxide snow. And then I decided to build a press to make dry ice uh, chunks. Uh, By that time, I was pretty nearly sick of that one. But then, ultraconductivity by golly, you know today, they've got that up very much higher by having the wires made of something else. And you know what that something else is? A ceramic. The same stuff that has those uh, uh, sort of little towers on the... Uh, 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 on the high wire tiles? On the, on the, yeah, on the high wires and uh, isolators? Yeah, isolators. And they found that ceramics uh, brought the uh, temperature up by several hundred degrees to make the wire of that. What kind of refrigeration process were you using to get down to absolute zero? What do you get into there? What, what refrigerants and... Uh, I don't know whether that was a nitrogen or what that was. It's, it's left me. But it's the same Carnot cycle where you have a compressor and a condenser and an evaporator type cycle. Yeah. Okay. Uh, with this thing, 
You know, these atom smashers, by golly, they put, they make the coils on the uh, magnets that are needed there. And they get down in the superconductive range very quickly. And for instance, for an atom smasher, by golly, they don't have to uh, uh, energize their magnets. They just keep going, huh? They, they get, they get uh, it going, and as long as they don't lose that temperature, why, uh, that thing runs forever without anything more. Huh. Where and, was the atom smasher that you worked on? No, I don't know as I was really on an atom smasher myself, but uh, I quickly recognized that this was a wonderful thing, for instance, for Commonwealth Edison. Generate your electricity at night when the things are cooling. When you're off peak, for heaven's sakes, don't run it during the dinner hour. Uh, and you got the equivalent of a of a, a big dam. Let me ask you, where did you go to from the Frick Company? What it, was it? Well. The Frick Company, I had, I was, uh, I guess the, uh, chief engineer of something or other. Uh, oh, oh, the Frick Company also had uh, uh, built dairy machine, or, or built, uh, uh, farm machinery by the uh, uh, reapers or uh, plows and I wasn't in that at all but uh, what happened there uh, the depression came along I remember I had gone up to Penn State. I had organized a class in uh, at Frick Company. At first, against their wishes, but at any rate, I would give uh, some of the uh, fellows that were doing the drafting, the engine, assisting the engineering. And I had a number of times asked them a question. So and so, what would you do and so forth? And I'd never get the answer. Then when I asked him, well, they didn't get it. Would you explain it to us? And I soon got over that. I said, you forget this ex explanation. You dig it out for yourself. And I'm willing to 
run you in, uh, run a school for you and make you a little more smarter on this business. Well, that was all right. And then I told him, I said, well, that's going to cost you $10 a, a week. That didn't go down. So uh, I took him for a while in the YMCA. They had a, a room there that was just fine. But the housekeeping was no good. I'd go up, we'd go up there, the, uh, all saw the, the, the blackboards hadn't been cleaned, the uh, erasers, like, what do they call them, uh, that you wipe them yeah, yeah. with, and you pound them later to clean them, yeah. they hadn't been cleaned, and I gave them a couple of warnings, and then I remembered that the parochial school, incidentally, Waynesboro was a town that had more different religious sects. The Holy Rollers, the uh, Mennonites, the Amish, the Jew, a couple of Jews, uh, Catholics. The Catholics were the only ones you could hate. They, they weren't enough of the others. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding you. Let me ask you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut this off in a little bit, but I want you to think a little bit about your, your time with Ashray as the president and the people there that you worked with through Ashray, and if you think of names and uh, things that you might have done in Ashray. Maybe I'll wake up during the night remembering a name. Okay. But uh, I had been the head of the uh, Standards Committee for quite a while. And incidentally, a lot of the standards that are still functioning today have my introduction. And then, of course, there's been progress and change. That's what addenda are for. Uh, I'm kind of proud of that I, I did get the uh, uh, standards committee moving and ma and make and that the, the standards very quickly after that became international. That's a that's probably one of the toughest committees in Ashray to head is the standards committee. That's a very volatile committee these days. Yes. I'm sure it was in your day. You know, the strange part of it is, while I was in those kind of, that kind of business with Ashray, I wasn't practicing that kind of engineering at all. Huh. Now, I'm not kidding you there. Uh, as I say, for instance, I got to be quite important in the dairy industry. I developed sanitary milk houses, and they had to wait for their day to come when roads were fixed, uh, fixed well enough that you could get, get in and out of the place with big trucks and so forth. And 
Are they, for instance, that brought on some problems? Uh, in the first place, how do you... What, what happens if you, got, if you, if you, if you get a, a, a bad milk, a bad tank of milk, and it all gets mixed? I'll tell you what happens. We worked that out pretty quick and pretty slick. Before I, one of these sanitary stainless tank in the farmer's milk house got emptied, there was a, a sample drawn. Each tank had a sample drawn. And that sample went, provided that uh, there wasn't anything found wrong with it at the farm, went along with the shipment and the uh, main dairy wouldn't uh, empty tanks until they had checked these samples. And you'd wonder, wonder, well, now what? Supposing there was a... Uh, one of those samples shows, this is it. Well, all right, they had a record of which tanks, which farms each one of them came from. But how about each cow? Okay. So the cows had to be examined. The veterinarians, you, you'd hope that they would come up with the solution of what was wrong. And uh, that cow would be out of the herd. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Uh, Close here, Leanne. I think I think we've done enough. Uh -huh. Aren't you tired? No, but I'm, I'll tell you. Yeah, you I'll tell you one, <laughs> one <laughs> that you'll uh, that you'll laugh off, off, over. This last uh, census, I walked up. Uh, I guess that. I don't know, that must have been five, ten years ago. I walked up to the census table and I spoke German to him. I really gave him an ear full of German and I can speak German without an accent. Or I could, I'm getting rusty in it. and. Uh, they finally said, uh, well, we can't get an interpreter. I said, you got an interpreter right here. I'll interpret it for you. <laughs> and, and they did. And then they didn't want to believe that I was a native-born American citizen. Because your German was so good, huh? Yeah, well, I was born in New York in 1899. And, uh... What day in 1899? June 8th. June 8th, 1899. That's... no, 18... Yeah, because I'll be 90 my next birthday. 
yeah, that's right. Okay. That's and uh, uh, for some reason or other, oh, on account of the travel to Europe, and uh, I finally showed him this birth certificate. <laughs> Well, I'm going to cut it off there. I think we've done enough of this for for tonight. Let me just kick it. But it's been good talking with you. Well, and it's. I'm going to pack this.